Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast. This is episode number three with Abdul Abad, uh, who is a, a true higher ed geek in every sense of the word. Uh, had him contribute to the blog uh, a while back, and I just knew that he was a perfect fit for this show um, to share uh, all that he does, his interests, and um, he's just huge into uh, data and analytics and uh, research and studies and uh, kind of all that kind of quantitative side of the work that we do that is really important uh, to augment and sort of support uh, the efforts that we do and the decisions that we make and, you know, how we start and stop things. So um, really appreciate Abdul's kind of thoughtful insights and um, his nature because he also comes from a philosophy background. So we get, to get into that a little bit um, of kind of what that gives his work now, uh, working in a higher ed in a, a very quantitative sense and kind of mindset. So um, really great episode. As always, check out all the cool stuff that we mentioned in this episode in the show notes uh, on the blog. Um, and uh, please do uh, let me know what you think of the show. I'm glad to, to hear folks uh, enjoying everything so far. But uh, yeah, there's only more great episodes to come uh, for the rest of this year. So uh, without further ado, and uh, after this quick message from our sponsor, this is episode number three with Abdul Abad. It's an honor to have our good friends at Swiftkick be a sponsor of the podcast because I've seen their work firsthand and it's truly unlike any student leadership training I've experienced. They've been voted best student leadership program unprecedented five times, so you know they must be doing something right. As a bonus for our listeners, Swiftkick is giving a $500 discount off their normal speaking fee if you mention Higher Ed Geek when you contact them. I highly recommend their trainings for your campus as your students will be talking about it for months afterwards. It's really great stuff. Check them out at swiftkickhq.com to learn more and let them know I sent you. Now, back to the show. Yeah, it's my second year and so there's not as much of a transition period and then also I'm taking uh, I'm taking an applied regression course, so I've been dying to take a statistics course for you know, a while. So now I'm finally taking it. And, um, it's one of those courses where once you get regression under your belt, it's the building block for other stuff. So if I wanted to move into more analyst type positions, I feel like I'm better equipped after this semester. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. yeah I think, um, on your end? yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a, a similar thing where I've now been in the job that I am now for like a year and a half. And, um, like going through everything once and just being a lot more kind of comfortable and confident, just knowing how to do stuff and just like what to expect and kind of getting it to a uh, pretty solid routine where we definitely have like ebbs and flows because our students have like, you know, it's a very unique um, kind of timeline with their, they have like 10 week modules and then they're off for three weeks and then another 10 week module for their courses and stuff. So very much like, has multiple kind of ups and downs throughout the year versus like a, you know, more traditional, um, academic year schedule. But, um, yeah, cause I think that's something that I've realized is just like, as much as I'm a person who likes, you know, just thinking of like abstract ideas and like, you know, just coming up with ideas or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, like I really appreciate like some sense of like structure and just like, you know, like, have also like moved almost like every two years and we expect to you know be generally around here um you know for the time being so it's just like just in a lot of different ways just like just you know having some like you know uh some routine some structure some kind of uh kind of comfort that way is definitely something that i've realized that i uh appreciate which i would have not you know guessed i guess uh you know years back but um so yeah, so it's good. It's very different. It's very unique, but I enjoy the uh, uh, just kind of like exploration of a very different part of like the higher ed realm and industry and stuff. So yeah, um, and and so what exactly are you working on now? Yeah, so you know, I, I'm obviously doing all this kind of just you know as a uh, the side endeavor, my day job, which um, yeah, I'm sure I'll, yeah, I'll get into like over time throughout all these episodes and stuff. But um, so. Yeah, I'm currently um, essentially like an academic advisor for online MBA students that are at American universities. So like we partner with universities to help them put their degree programs online. So oh, that's kind of the, cool. yeah, like kind of the, <laughs> yeah, like the industry term is like an online program manager. So there's other 
companies out there to do similar things, but we do a very like robust kind of suite of things that we offer um, to universities, like part of the partnership and stuff. But it's like we also Pretty like cool. build the platform, so it's like we build basically our version of like a Blackboard or um, you know one of those sort of things. And to um, like, and then I fit in. Like I help these students. So like the the biggest I guess like value proposition is that the university does not have to do as much you know, heavy lifting to get a program off the ground. It, it's still their curriculum, their faculty and, you know, their brand. And then they all have, have the final say on stuff. But, you know, we're going to do like the marketing and recruitment and the student support and, you know, faculty training and those sort of things and like producing the content for the um, you know, the learning management system and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's, I guess at the very least, I'm just learning a lot about just like. It's pretty cool. Yeah, this, that's a different part of higher ed. Oh, yeah. Because I do the advising, but I do advising at a community college in person, which is its own kind of um, it's its own thing because it's a different student population. And then I can only imagine because I have interest in online ed research wise. So thinking about just technology use in higher ed and being an online program manager, I imagine that changes things. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, definitely fit into like a very unique space in the, uh, the higher ed realm there. So um yeah. So yeah, at the very least, just learning a lot. But um, yeah, I mean, because I think your journey, I'm curious about because I, I just talked to somebody who they worked professionally for a handful of years. They're now going back for their master's of ed and like higher ed and stuff. So I know you've been going pretty full force here for like the past several years getting, you know, so you went from from bachelor to the master's, master's to um, kind of the doctoral journey. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, just kind of give that that introduction of who you are, you know, what you're doing now and kind of your professional journey of kind of how you got to be where you are today. Let's see. So right now I'm uh, I'm splitting my time between Hudson County Community College, where I work as an advisor. And then um, I also work as a EDM and EDM an EDM and EDD. So an advanced master's and doctorate inquiries coordinator. So I talk with prospective students mm -hmm. who are interested in applying to the same program that I'm a current doctoral student. Um, so higher and post-secondary education at Teachers College, Columbia University. And then, um, and I'm also working on a research team on the side. And so, um, so I've got a mix of kind of graduate admissions work that I'm doing. So I help with open house, I help with webinars. And then the most fun part is the talking to prospective students part and kind of seeing if the degree is a good fit for them through conversation and what they might get from the degree. Um, I don't play any process in like actually looking at applications, which makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, and, uh, uh, and let's see what else. And uh, yeah, but it's, it's interesting because I started at a community college. So I started at Hudson County Community College where I'm advising now. And then I did a degree in liberal arts there. Then I went to Rutgers University and did philosophy. Um, and then I went to UConn for higher education and student affairs for my master's. And then I went straight into um, Teachers College, Columbia University for my doctorate. But that was always the plan since community college, uh, not necessarily in higher education, but I had always planned since I was about 19 to get a doctorate. Um, Interesting. So that's kind of the, the short journey, but um, but yeah, the, I, I knew, I was reading some philosophy articles, I caught the philosophy bug, and I really started to read about like, oh, how did they, how did they become professors of this? Then I learned about PhDs, and um, as a first generation student, I'm the first person in my family to finish um, pretty much all of those degrees. And so I had to really kind of like read on my own and figure out. Um, so while I was at community college, I actually picked three professors I wanted to study with at Rutgers because Rutgers was ranked like in the top three in the world. Mm. And um, so I knew I would have to make a good impression on professors and not in a transactional way, but more like uh, I should take at least two courses was what was the advice I read online. So I was like, I'm going to take two courses with Robert Matthews. I want to take two courses with Professor Peter Klein and another two courses with Andy Egan. Let me try and do my best in there and hopefully that after doing my best that they'd be willing to write recommendations. And those opportunities actually turned out to be more substantive than I could have even you know, dreamed where I ended up on a committee where we got to bring in a world-class philosopher. Um, I ended up getting like opportunities to do fellowship and research um, and like summer institutes through them. And then, um, cause they always had me in mind because I was super active. Um, and then 
uh, I, one of the professors, Professor Egan, ended up serving as my thesis advisor. And so then that was like a really good foundation in higher ed. And then um, that, but during that time I caught the bug as a resident assistant and kind of found my way into higher ed. Yeah, and I know that's where we uh, crossed paths a little bit. That was like, uh, went to Rutgers for the college student affairs program for um, uh -huh. yeah for grad school and stuff. So um, yeah, I knew of you then uh, and I knew that you were really great and doing great things. And I think, uh, yeah, I think one thing that, cause I know like for me, like I've written about, like I was a history major in undergrad and sort of what I feel like that still gives me just as a person and, you know, a person working in higher ed and stuff like that of just like I like knowing the context of things like the history of just like a decision or just like you know what what's going on is just you know history tells you the story of just like how we got here so like everything has a cause and effect and sort of a you know a thread line that you can follow through so you know obviously you were super into philosophy you know you were kind of committed to that as a potential path for yourself um, and then you kind of you know pivoted a little bit so do you feel like you're kind of like applying philosophical ideas in a certain way in your work now? Like, what, what do you feel like that gives you now that you're kind of going, you know, you, you thought of this plan when you were like 19 and you're kind of like, you know, <laughs> tinkering with it a little bit of just like, okay, maybe I want to like, because that's what I think sometimes for people who do like social work degrees, but then they work in higher ed. It's like, well, yeah, you're doing yeah. all like applied social work on a campus or something. So like, well, how do you feel like that philosophical core of you, like, how does that fit into your life? Yeah, so it's interesting because philosophy is one of those very broad, very, very broad disciplines. And then the scientists sprout from philosophy, right? So the stuff that Aristotle and Plato did, Aristotle's really kind of like one of the first scientists. And then um, later on we get Newton who's doing what he called, he didn't say I was just doing physics, he said I was doing natural uh, philosophy basically. And, uh, and then science gets so technical that it branches off from philosophy. And so I did philosophy and cognitive science. And so I've always, so I have a very kind of like interdisciplinary bend, which makes sense going into higher ed. Higher ed is, if you think about like the four dominant perspectives, it's psychology, sociology, anthropology, and there's one more economics. So if you look at a lot of the stuff in the research literature, they come from, it's usually an economist that's like, I'm going to apply my economical thinking to problems in higher ed. And then a sociologist will do something similar. And then there are some people that bridge the gap. So in the case of, for me, philosophy was very focused on the quality of arguments and coming up with good arguments and what, what it takes uh, for an argument to hold or to fall. So, that, so there was that. And then there's the interdisciplinary leaning that I have where I'm always trying to think of. Uh, so at this point, I'm interested in learning analytics and educational data mining, which are fields that think about dealing with large amounts of data or thinking about ways to model student learning. And I think that probably wouldn't have been possible without the flexibility and thinking that I got from philosophy and the kind of interdisciplinary bend that I got from cognitive science. And so I see it kind of coming up all the time. Um, and then, I mean, more specifically, there have been times where we talk about epistemology, for example, theory of knowledge, how we come to know things. And that comes up in the classroom where you'll see inevitably any theory you look at will have assumptions about what counts as knowledge. So specifically in student affairs, you see that with, um, right, you, have, you might have quantitative researchers and, and you have qualitative researchers, but if you look in the field of higher ed in general, right, we put a, a big value on what students bring or what their thoughts and, and um, their values. And so we put a lot of value on people and kind of how they make sense of the world, where some disciplines might not be so concerned with how people necessarily make sense of the world uh, they might be just interested in, in um, you know, their actions or just kind of modeling it without taking that into account. And so that's an epistemological assumption. And uh, so that guides the theories you make. It guides the insights that you can bring by using certain theories to study problems. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a mixture of abstract and specificity. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, and that's like, because, yeah, like it being just a very broad discipline, it's just like that's the whole idea of just like, it's something that I've come to learn because it's interesting just personally seeing the, the growth that I've had on certain issues of like, you know, like the liberal arts education. A lot of people are just like, what's even the point? Like, it's like, well, like that's exactly oh. the point. Like you're just like augmented to just like think critically and just have these like skills and like yeah, even just like being able to come up with like sound arguments. Because I, I took like a random philosophy course at undergrad and it was basically that. It was like uh, contemporary moral 
dilemmas or something like that and it was just like digging into these like you know like the slippery slope and just like different random like ways that people like base arguments that are kind of flimsy and make a lot of assumptions you know and like um so it's like there's some very practical stuff like that there's some stuff that's like hard to quantify where it's just like i don't know like i just think critically like i can just think in a different way i can look at things in a different you know from a different perspective or whatever just in terms of you know the courses that i took and stuff like that so it's just you know definitely hammers that point home that like you know you could have gone any number of ways you know whether it was pursuing you know a philosophy phd or you know something completely different you know you've kind of settled on higher ed but it just you know gives you a lot of a, a lot of tools a lot of uh, a lot of skills to you know be successful so um yeah it's pretty cool um well, yeah, so I think, you know, you, you've alluded to, I think, because uh, you wrote on my site before, and that's why I wanted to kind of have you on as somebody that I think kind of gets this kind of abstract idea of, like, uh, higher ed geek. So, you know, just asking everybody, like, the things that they geek out about. So I think you have that, like, you know, the geeky, nerdy bend of just, like, loving, you know, data and research and statistics and that kind of stuff, which is, like, really important with where, you know, just things across the board are going and just, like, kind of, we have all this stuff, you know, and we, what are we doing with it? How are we interpreting it? Um, so, I guess, like, you've covered a little bit of what you kind of geek out about, like, professionally, and um, I know you wrote about, like, video games and doing kind of some, like, you know, um, you know, deep dives of, like, uh, kind of your experience gaming and like the lessons learned which i love that's like definitely totally my thing um so i guess yeah just elaborate on like the things that you geek out about currently and like kind of how you got into them like have you always been into those things for your whole life and um yeah just talk about that for a bit yeah it's interesting right because professionally like my research interests are in in online education uh learning analytics and so I'm broadly interested in ways to improve college teaching and learning, but in online courses. And but that while that's a professional interest, it's rooted in kind of personal experiences I had. So like I was a nerd since I was young and, um, you know, a lot of my interactions, my best social interactions were actually online. Mm -hmm. And so I would meet other people on forums and we would chat and we could chat at length about things that maybe my my real life, you know, um, friends or peers uh, didn't want to talk about. And so there, it was this opportunity to build substantive social relationships. And, um, but basically, yeah, I would hang out on gaming forums, like the silent Hill community forum, which I still, um, I'm actually a moderator on now. And, um, oh, wow. unfortunately the silent Hill game series has like kind of, it's, it's not as good as it once was, uh, because the company that supported it just kind of just gave pretty much gave up. But, um, the first couple of games are quite good. And uh, they're theoretically robust, and so um, you know, I nerd about nerded about that. And um, I'm trying to think, like, uh, gaming-wise, I don't have too many games that I'm nerding out about now. Um, I'm nerding out about a, uh, a lot of like TV shows and stuff, uh, yeah. uh, um, upcoming TV shows at least. Like, there's Mindhunter that's going to come out on Netflix uh, about you know uh, the FBI for the first time trying to figure out how to profile serial killers. Because the FBI originally started uh, trying to pursue John Dillinger, and um, so that you know the purpose was to pursue uh, bank robbers. So they didn't really have in mind somebody, you know, violence against strangers in particular, um, to the extent that we see with serial killers. And uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. There's another series called Dark, stuff like that. I'm not sure if I actually answered the question though no no yeah i guess it's like you have like a you know some different stuff going on there and i think yeah for me like because i think with gaming i don't know if it's like where you're at now just like because yeah it, it partially like i'm into so much stuff and right now i'm almost like i, I kind of went all in on tv for a while and now i'm like scaling back on that and now i'm like gaming more because i didn't do that at all for like the past couple of years so i just got like a system like i got like a ps4 last year and i'm like kind of doing that a little bit more um, or different like uh, games on my computer and stuff. So it's, it's like sometimes I feel like that. It's just like the ebbs and flows of sometimes just what you have time for. Like if it's like yeah, I can do like a TV episode here and there, or like you know I can download TV episodes and watch them if I'm like you know traveling or you know somewhere else other than home. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes it's just like you know the changing at, you know kind of flows and like our routines and what we have time for. But um, yeah, I mean I'll, I'll at least link out to the. Um, to the post, uh, I 
feel like it was at least one. I don't know if you wrote another one, but like uh, about like gaming, kind of like the lessons learned and kind of thoughts on that. But yeah, I think I wrote something on Bloodborne, and so that's um actually I have a tattoo of something from Bloodborne. That's how much I like Bloodborne, uh, <laughs> you know, because that's a brutal game series. That's a uh, Dark Souls, same same makers of Dark Souls and Demon Souls, and where in Bloodborne it's like the whole point is you learn by dying, you learn through failure. Um, and I think that's just applicable to life. So um, I'm trying to think like, uh, I, didn't exp- I didn't say this in my professional journey, but when I was applying to doctoral programs, I applied to three philosophy programs and I applied to 11 master's programs. I got into nine of 11 master's programs in higher education and then I didn't get into any of the philosophy programs. Hmm. Um, and then I got, then when I applied for my master's into higher ed, I applied to three uh, doctoral programs in higher ed well, two in higher ed and then one in um, educational psychology. And I got into all three doctoral programs. So it was like the three and three. I, first time I just like didn't make it at all into philosophy, right? And so that was, uh, you know, a moment of failure makes it sound rough, but it is, it is a kind of failure. And, um, you know, so I had to kind of rethink what I wanted to do. Part of it is maybe I should have applied to more schools. Another part of it is, you know, I'm not entirely sure I would have nec- I would have fit into like a strict philosophy uh, program, and that higher ed affords me some things um, that maybe I wouldn't have been able to get philosophy wise. But like that mm-hmm. failure, that moment of failure was very useful, right? And then, but you know, I learned that partially through a game like Bloodborne. So yeah, that's good stuff. That's what I'm all about. Um, and that's kind of like what I want this podcast to be, you know, you sort of alluded to at least just so like with Bloodborne and that kind of like anecdote, it's just like, I mean, you know, maybe just throughout all of time, not even just like what you're into currently. And, you know, you mentioned the the stuff with like forums and, and like online relationships and community and stuff. So like, I guess if you want to kind of deep dive into any of those things that you've already mentioned or other ways that like your hobbies and interests over time have like positively contributed to your life, like what, what are the things that those interests have brought to you? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, one thing is, you know, it's brought me really meaningful friendships. So I have friends that I'm friends with on Facebook for years now, either through Silent Hill community or um, actually some of my best friends that like I talk to pretty much every day on Skype. Um, uh, And I've met very few times in person, if at all. Uh, They and and I've got, you know, it's weird. I've got like my real life friend group that my friends from high school, but then I've got my like gaming buddies. And um, who are, for me, while I haven't met them in person, I think online environments, when you're playing like a game for a couple hours a day, you can easily amass the same amount of hours that you, you spend over maybe 14 years with your in re- and your, your real life friends. Because, um, for example, if you're growing up in your teens, if you, if you have friends from your teens, um, you know, often it's you go to school then you hang out for an hour or two after, and then you, you, you all have to go off and do homework or something. Whereas if, uh, so in the case of gaming, it's like you might spend four or five hours a day because you're home, you know, and it just quickly kind of adds up. But, um, you know, I think friendships, you know, I've gained, I gained, uh, the, the two friends from Skype, uh, to go back to that, I, I met them through a game called Dead Space 2. And so Dead Space 2 was set up where it was single player and multiplayer. And the multiplayer was, uh, it was two rounds. So one team would play as the humans and they had to go grab an objective. And then there were necromorphs. So there were these kind of like zombie-like things. And so the other team would play the necromorphs and their goal was to stop you from bringing the objective back to a certain point. And then um, you would switch. So I actually met them while playing that. And we played that a bunch. And then now it's been, we've played the whole Dark Souls series together. We played Destiny. Um... You know, we were there for low points in life, high points in life. Um, and so, you know, there's something about that experience of like, what is it about those substantial friend- substantial friendships that were facilitated by online technology? Um, what is it about maybe me from a personality perspective that this is conducive for? And then are there things that we can leverage? Because it's always me thinking, are there things that we can, I've had positive experiences. I've seen people that have had not so positive experiences. Are there ways that we can leverage um, things that happen in my positive experiences to help other students. Um, and if we can, what students does it apply to? What students doesn't it apply to and why? And so th- always thinking back and it's kind of this, um, for me, I don't, I don't put like hard boundaries on it. So sometimes it's, 
these personal experiences I've had, how can it, is there something there that I can use for research or investigate research wise and then vice versa? Oh, the research is saying this, does it apply to my experience? Why doesn't it? Oh, that's interesting. And you know, might, so it might encourage the kind of back and forth. Um, but yeah, so I mean, very clearly I've gained some of my best friends through gaming. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, because I think even for me, it's like I, I haven't had any relationships like that that have like persist, like persisted through like you know multiple games or like a long time, and that's like awesome that it's ha- like that's how it's happened for you. And because I think even like someone wouldn't even have to put the pressure on themselves to try and make something like that happen because I know for me it's just like even like you know, in high school and like early college, like even just in that moment, it helped me feel kind of more like included or I I had people kind of, you know, that, you know, if we were like, oh, like, you know, they were, they were looking for me or like they wanted to, to, you know, kind of hang out and play the game or whatever. Like it just helped in that moment. And then, you know, it helped me to kind of feel more confident going out into the world just to do any number of things, you know? So it just was like having that sense of community, even in a moment, um, but then especially if you have like a long, long standing connection, that's like, I guess it's, it's just so it's almost like just more pure and simple and kind of like straightforward. Like it, it's not, it, you know, in-person interactions and kind of things like that can just get so complex and just like, obviously you can game from wherever, whenever you are kind of thing. Like it just, uh, there's a lot of benefits and, uh, yeah, it's certainly something that I think working in the online space, I think at this point we're definitely mastering like the delivery of like academic content and just like doing everything in a good way. But then it's like, I think that's kind of the next level is how do we kind of maximize the potential of community in terms of like, you know, online education and like all these students, because for us, like it it helps a little bit is that they do have like weekly live sessions over like uh, Adobe connect. So, you know, it's basically video conferencing. They see each other, they're interacting live each week for their class, you know, they're all, over the country, all over the world. Um, but, uh, I think beyond that, helping them to feel like, you know, there actually are building connections, um, you know, through the program and stuff, I definitely feel like kind of, kind of next level. So, um, um, well, I guess, yeah, you mentioned a few things, I guess, anything else, I guess some stuff that you're looking forward to, which is like kind of the, the last question. So I'll have to link out to that stuff, but I guess first, like what, is anything that you're kind of currently reading, watching, listening, playing, uh, like, so like what's the stuff that you're consuming right now that you're really enjoying? Well, so, you know, most, uh, it's interesting in undergrad, I didn't really, uh, when you look at a syllabus, you, you often, there's like recommended readings Mm -hmm. and I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, but now I'm taking the, a regression course. So, you know, regression is a method where you try to predict, at least in a simple linear regression, you're trying to predict one variable from another. A common example is, hey, can we predict a first year student's GPA in college from their high school grades? Can we use the high school GPA to explain what their first year GPA is? And then multiple regression is just adding more of those variables. So it might be, do gender, race, and high school GPA matter for a first year student's GPA? And whether you can explain it in terms of those things. So I'm reading like the actual recommended readings. Like I have like the two textbooks that are additional and I kind of like skim through those to get different explanations when I'm not reading that, like when it's not technical material, um, I'm working my way through a book called mind Hunter, which is the basis for that Netflix series. Um, and kind of how the FBI came to establish a procedure for interviewing serial killers. Um, you know, uh, what else am I looking at these days? Uh, you know, film, uh, TV wise, I'm trying to get into wisdom of the crowd. Um, the gifted, which is about, uh, you know, that's in the X-Men universe. Mm -hmm. So it's it's, kids with mutant powers so far. And, uh, I do want to check out inhumans, but I'm not too sure. (laughs) Uh, I'm not too sure if that's going to be worth it. And it's funny that I've gotten to the point in my life where I'm like, I, I don't know if I want to like spend an hour on this when I could go watch something else or go read something more uh, substantive. And then uh, I'm trying to think. Listening to, I used to listen to a podcast called Partially Derivative, which is a uh, data science podcast. So they talk about interesting stories with data. Um, so one story was, 
<laughs> and I always love this story because uh, basically Amazon started advertising to someone's daughter, um, like uh, baby supplies, mm-hmm. and this father's like, I'm offended or something like that, like that you're uh, you're advertising all this stuff or. It might have been like they even sent something in the mail where they're like, oh, you might benefit from this. And he's like, my daughter's not pregnant. Like, what is wrong with you guys? Why are you advertising this stuff? And then like a few days later, the, the he calls back the company. He's like, so I owe you guys an apology. There's a conversation that's been had. And uh, apparently, you know, we might be in need of the things that you're advertising. And that so like the predictive algorithm knew before the dad did that this that, that his child was pregnant. And I was like, oh, wow, that's uh, that's kind of scary, but also funny. And um, so, I, you know, I'll listen to Partially Derivative and, um, you know, I'm a huge music buff, so I like to compose music when I can. And uh, so I'm listening to uh, the Vamplified OST for uh, the original soundtrack for the, uh, D- uh, the DLC of uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer. And uh, there's some really cool songs on there by a guy named Danny Baranowski who did the music for The Binding of Isaac. He did it for Super Meat Boy. And so he does really cool electronic uh, music. Very cool. Yeah, and that's something that, like, uh, one of my party nerdier things, that to somebody on the outside, I guess, because, yeah, if you're like, like, oh, I'm listening to, like, because I think just something that, like listening <laughs> at length to, like, movie soundtracks is one yeah. than, like, a soundtrack for a video game or something. But it's like, there's some really good music in there. Like, especially if you're, like, I don't know, if you're, like, writing a paper or, like, you're trying just to get, like, you know, like all psyched up and stuff, just like oh, absolutely, on some like epic, uh, you know, movie scores or video game. Uh, that's stuff. yeah, that's how I write. So like, I'll get a cup of coffee, I sit at my desk, and I will just put that on because usually it's like an hour of music, mm-hmm. and I can just focus. And usually they don't have vocals because usually when we listen to music, we focus so much on the vocals, and then that can be distracting. Whereas with like movie soundtracks or game soundtracks, it's kind of it'll pump you, but it won't distract you. At least in my case, I love. That's uh, that's how I get in my zone for writing. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, and um, to end everything on a positive note, you've mentioned you know some shows and stuff that you're looking forward to. Um, anything else? Just like you know, if you want to try and hit on all the notes, but just like you know, stuff that you're looking forward to uh, professionally in your life or just in the world, just uh, things that are you know kind of keeping you kind of excited for um, you know the days to come. Yeah, well, I'm I'm excited about those TV shows that are coming out. Like, uh, Mindhunter comes out this Friday, and um, I'm a big fan of like dark thrillers. 1922 is coming out on Netflix, so this is just a good month. I'm looking forward to Halloween and actually mm-hmm. like getting dressed up. And then, um, you know, professionally, I am gonna go to a, a like a bigger conference for the first time in my life. So I'm gonna go to the uh, Association for the Study of Higher Ed um, in November in Houston. And uh, it is, uh, it's ASH for short, but I've never been to like a NASPA or an mm. ACPA. And so I'm doing a research paper presentation with two colleagues from the University of Connecticut. And, um, and so I'm super stoked for that because it'll be interesting to meet scholars. I want to, you know, I, whose work I've read and maybe I'll get a chance to like have coffee with them. And, uh, and it's, it'll just be interesting to get used to what it's like to go to conferences and I imagine in some ways that might be overwhelming, but in other ways it's going to be very, um, just very informative and, and I'll probably come out pretty psyched, uh, from it. So I'm really looking forward to going to one of those professionally for the first time in my, like a bigger one. I've been to smaller conferences, but like ones that are like representative of a field I haven't been to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to those Netflix shows and, uh, as nerdy as it is, you know, I, I always look forward to like my stats courses, like uh, there's a lab and a lecture and that's literally people look at me strange. I'm like, no, that's the highlight of my week. I've gone in when I'm sick. Like that's how pumped I am because um, I don't want to miss anything. And because uh, I think there's a I mean, this is an aside, but uh, the, I mean, because people people can tend to be scared of numbers. But the, the thing about numbers, if you're doing education research, right, even when you're a quantitative researcher, you're usually telling st- it's really you're using the method to tell a story about people mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And so uh, what really kind of like is satisfying about that is now I can read articles and understand the story that professionals are trying to say um, about people usually. And then um, or, or you're trying to tell stories about programs that affect people. So at the end of the day, we're talking about people and it's just one way of doing that. And um, 
So that's really the, it's more the, I can now read those articles. I have the competency of reading those articles and understand what's going on, but also the, I'm developing the skill set where I'll be able to tell those stories one day, um, about people. Yeah. And that, that's actually like a great point to end on because generally like, uh, kind of the spirit of higher ed geek and just the idea of people geeking out and being excited about things and all that is, you know, parts of kind of like geek culture, or just like, you know, this sort of, uh, um, you know, community, you know, the people, you know, go to comic cons and cosplay and just like, you know, will build connections through, you know, gaming and all that. I think generally one of my things that I was just talking to somebody else about was that like, if only everyone like, cause yeah, I, I just totally appreciate how like, you know, excited you are of like the thing you're looking forward to is like your, you know, stats course kind of thing, you know, is that like, if only everyone was so excited about what they did, like if we just had a, a world of people that were just like really engaged in what they're doing. And um, cause I think it's definitely two sides of a coin. It's like for one, just like being excited and engaged and enthusiastic about what they do, but also like doing what they're good at and like doing what they feel like they can kind of positively contribute um, to the world. So I think at the very least, just, you know, the fact that you're super excited about your stats course and stuff that is, you know, warms my heart. It's like, it's awesome. And I, I just really appreciate that you, you know, that you're kind of, uh, you know, following that and like going to be that person that, yeah, that, cause I think that's such an awesome way to frame it is that, you know, you're helping to tell stories through this data, you know, like, or yeah, if you're like trying to support a policy change, like you will do it like with the data, you're going to do it with, you know, hard facts and, you know, things that people can understand and frame it, you know, things with evidence that, um, you know, people may just be kind of anecdotally be like, oh, I think we should do this or do that. It's like, well, yeah, I can support this with, you know, with evidence. So, um, yeah, and I think it'll be really good. Uh, yeah, just like going to like a national conference. Yeah, you're just getting exposure to so many different people. And I think that's always been, to me, kind of the unequivocal, like positive aspect of a, natu uh, of a national conference. It's just like being able to meet so many different people all at once in the same place, like, you're just never going to be able to get that anywhere else. And like, sometimes for me, like going several years to like different conferences, it's like, yeah, like sometimes the content, like the speakers and the presentations can be like, you know, hit or miss. Cause it's just, you know, it's hard to know, like, you know, how good it's going to be for you personally and like what you're looking for or whatever. But, um, yeah, at the very least you're just getting, you know, the ability to have FaceTime with so many different people, you know, in the same place. So, um, yeah, so that'll be, uh, that'll be a good time. All good stuff going on to look forward to. And uh, I guess with that, yeah, we will wrap it up here. I do appreciate your time, Abdul. And uh, yeah, I really uh, appreciate you coming on here to chat about everything. And um, yeah, we'll link out to ways for folks to um, connect with you. And um, yeah, I just wish you all the best with uh, kind of going through this academic year and have a good time at the, uh, the conference. And then, uh, yeah, I will uh, yeah, talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, you know, best of luck to you on your end as well. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good rest of your day, man. You too. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening. And I'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast. <laughs>